thumb in Romans chapter 8, because we'll be flipping over to that book as well, so you can be prepared to follow along with that as well. So John chapter 9 and Romans chapter 8, and today we're going to be looking at that, you know, like David had been praying, he pretty much prayed the passage, so I think I could just close in prayer now and we could just go. But as he was praying, you know, yes, we're going to be looking at a man who was born blind. And the question I really had was, can all things really work together for good? Because we're going to see how Jesus remarked that this was for the glory of God. Well, a guy born blind was for the glory of God? That can actually sound kind of callous, but we're going to be looking at that today. So let's pray, and uh, we're going to get into our study. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for uh, the word you have given us. That even this account of a one man that you met, that you intervened in his life, and that you changed him for all eternity, that we will get to meet one day in heaven, is a glorious thing. It is amazing to consider. This unnamed man, he's absolutely unknown to us. He's anonymous to us. But oh, he's not to you. You know him by name. And he's with you. So Lord, I pray that you would talk to us this morning. That you would speak to our hearts. And that we would see your goodness, your grace, your providence, and your mercy. That you pour out on us so freely. Thank you, Lord, for this time we get together in your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So. Obviously, if we're starting John chapter 9 this morning, that means last week we finished our study in John chapter 8, where we saw Jesus make a truly amazing claim. In verse 58 of John 8, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus, right there in one statement, made his divinity clear. This man who stood boldly in front of the spiritual leaders of the Jews was claiming to be God incarnate. And this was a claim that those men could not bring themselves to believe. For if they did, it would have changed everything for them. So they stood in obstinate pride because they truly loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God, as John will tell us later in his gospel. All of that kept them in rebellion toward God. They didn't see it, but that's the reality of it. They were in rebellion toward God, and they rejected Jesus so much so that in verse 59 we see this. We see it says, Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. They took up stones. For in their rejection of Jesus, they fully believed that he had just committed blasphemy, that he claimed equality with God. So they took up stones. And we're told Jesus slipped away into the crowd and left, leaving them standing there holding stones with no one to throw them at. Well, the next thing that John will bring to our attention is an act that supports Jesus' claim of deity. For this next section shows us something that could only be done by God himself. So please, if you're able, stand with me and let's read through our passage for today. We're going to read through quite a few verses, but we're only going to get through five of them in John today. But I want you to get the flow of the narrative to be able to pick up the account as John gives it to us. So John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. 
Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not the one who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He's like him. He said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes opened? Verse 11. He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. Then they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? Who you say is born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He's of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Verse 24. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he's from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard they had cast him out. When he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your compassion, your mercy, and your grace, and your love that you poured out on this one this one guy, this man, for we don't know how long, but from birth, was blind. And God, you had compassion on him. You touched him. You gave him sight. You did something unheard of since the earth began. A man who had no sight from birth suddenly could see. What an amazing thing you did. Oh Lord, may we truly believe this narrative, this account. And may we stand in wonder and awe at the power, the majesty, and the glory of our Savior. Speak to us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, like I said, we're only going to get through the first five verses of this narrative this morning as we're going to spend some time also in, in Romans 8. So, again, please put your thumb in that passage as we're going to be looking there today too. But regardless, the eighth chapter of John ended with Jesus passing by the Pharisees through the midst of the people. 
And chapter 9 begins with Jesus passing by the people, passing by someone else. He passes by a man born blind. Now, even though the statements come one after the other, John's not really indicating that this was immediate or that this ha- or if this happened later. If this encounter was while he was leaving from the Pharisees or if Jesus saw him later, that's not really the point. More, this encounter shows the heart of Jesus, which is why I think John put it here, that, he, that Jesus would leave the ones considered important to the Jews. He left the Pharisees to go and tend to one who's considered an outcast and a sinner, this one blind man. And also it shows an encounter that helps to validate the claim Jesus had made as to who he is, equal to God validating it by performing an act that had been unseen before, ever, giving sight to a person who had been blind since birth. This is what we see here as we begin this ninth chapter of John. Again, it says in verse 1, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the phrasing suggests that this was a topic of discussion between the disciples, not just a question from one disciple, but they were talking amongst themselves about the guy as they walked past. Why would they ask this? Well, this was the prevailing belief of the day. This is what was taught. The disciples would have been instructed through their upbringing in Judaism that sin and hurt, injury, or handicap are all linked together. That human hurt is the result of human sin. Not just generally, but specifically. So their view was that either this man sinned, which is amazing to me, while he was still in the womb, was it his fault he was born blind, or was it his parents' sin? Did they do something wrong and so God struck him blind? that this blindness was a result of judgment from God. That was the thought. That's what was taught. So the disciples regarded this man as an unsolved riddle, theologically. They really show no interest in helping this guy. Again, I don't think at this point they even saw that as a possibility, because as the man himself is going to say, this is something that had never been done since creation, that a man born blind would see. But the disciples did seem more interested in the theology of it all, in figuring out the cause of his condition. It was, he was a curiosity to them, shown by their immediate conclusion that this man's plight was because he or his parents had earned this blindness. It was his just reward for sin. Jesus, though, he's going to show them a different heart for this man, not a heart of judgment, but a heart of love and mercy. He's not going to dwell on the theological puzzle, but he's going to focus on actually helping the man and setting him free from his affliction, but also to set him free from this self-righteous judgmental attitude that others had toward him. And As we will see, there will be some who are not free from that heart of self-righteousness, but more we will see that this man is free from the effect of what others think of him as he will boldly stand in all that Jesus has done for him. And he will stand that Jesus is who he says he is. Now we can look at the disciples' comment and think, wow, what a rather cold question to ask. I can't believe that this is what they, that, that even they thought. How could they be followers of Jesus and think things like this of other people? The reality is, though, you know, we are Christians. We do have the spirit of the living God dwelling inside of us. And we still can often wonder if where there is more than an ordinary sufferer, there might be more than an ordinary sinner. We still tend to think that. Our hearts are just as judgmental and ugly and self-righteous in our own flesh as we look at those we consider others or them or they don't look quite right or don't quite act that right or have an issue that they're dealing with that may be chronic. You may look at it and go, well, I wonder if there's sin in their life. We may not say it the same way, but honestly, our heart is just as ugly 
as it was back in the days of Jesus. So, <coughs> while it may not have been a surprise that the disciples would ask this question, being it was the prevailing doctrine, it did not make this theology correct. And Jesus wants to teach them this truth. So Jesus responds to them by saying it was neither. Look at verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Well, first, Jesus says that the man's blindness was a birth defect. It was not caused by some specific sin on the part of the man or his parents. Birth defects and other such tragedies are sometimes due to sinful behavior of the parents. That's true. There are issues caused in the development of a baby brought on by overt sinful action. That can happen. Yet far more often, and in the case Jesus spoke of here, it's due simply to the general sin inherent to mankind. Our fallen condition in general, not due to any specific sin. Because it all stems back to the sin of Adam that set the principle of death in motion. And it's associated destruction and deformations in the world. And we've had to deal with it ever since the fall in the garden. What that indicates, of course, is that we're not living in a world where we can always expect perfection. That may be a newsflash to you. It may not. <laughs> but we live in a fallen world. Creation has been marred and scarred by the sin in human nature. From Genesis to Revelation. The scriptures declare that we are living in a broken world, a fragmented world, a world which is not what it once was, nor is it what it shall be. That's the reality of the world in which we live. For the present, we are afflicted with hurts and damage and injuries and difficulties and hardships. That's part of life today. And it's all a result of the introduction of the principle of human evil. Of sin into human life and it stems from the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The scriptures confirm that everybody is affected by this principle of human evil, which is why we need a savior. Many of us think we've escaped all this <clears throat> because we were not born with evident handicaps. We seem pretty normal, <laughs> but that's compared to other humans. But in fact, We've all been warped and scarred by the sin inherent to mankind, which is why Paul can assert to us that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, everywhere. And in every way, humanity reflects the weakness and depravity resulting from the fall. That's why our minds cannot help but to think of sin. It's why our hearts stray to evil so easily. It's why we have to endure hardship so often. It's why we struggle to maintain right relationship. Our sin nature fights against our spiritual nature. And truth is, our flesh nature knows exactly how to wage war in this way. We tend to like our flesh, flesh nature better than we like our spiritual nature. That's why we sin. We choose to because we like it. Even while our spiritual nature longs for and cries out, for deliverance and victory. Now I asked you to put your thumb in Romans 8, so go ahead and flip over to there now. In Romans 8, Paul is telling us these type of things. Look at Romans 8, beginning in verse 18. He said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. You know, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden and sin entered the world, it was not just mankind that was subjected to the effect of sin. The perfection of creation all that God had made and called good 
suddenly was no longer the same. And creation longs to be restored to perfection as the weight of sin is a heavy weight to bear. So just like our hearts long for this day, creation groans and labors for liberty as well. Even though in the here and now we groan along with all of creation for the hope of what is to come, we know that in the perseverance and patience of the waiting, we are assured as if it has already happened that there will be the day to come when we are with our Savior. Now Paul didn't try to sugarcoat it all though. We will face sufferings in this life. There will be issues in this life. Nature and creation cannot help but add to the sufferings that we inflict upon ourselves. Paul experienced a lot of suffering, most of it extremely difficult. He probably endured more suffering and hardship than we will ever face, yet he still considered that the future glory outweighed the present sufferings, which is why nothing could move him, as he told us in the book of Acts. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus did not rise again, if what we follow did not really happen, if the gospel was not true, if there was no hope of heaven, then the Christian life is foolish and tragic and that we would be the most pitiable of, of, of men. But in the light of the truth of all that Jesus has done and the truth that he has risen, and is awaiting the time to take us to be with him in the light and scope of eternity, the Christian life is the wisest and best choice anyone can make. And the coming glory is to be revealed in us, Paul says. The interesting thing in the phrasing is that the coming glory will not only be revealed to us, but will actually be revealed in us. <clears throat> That's a foreshadowing of the things to come. The implication of the phrasing is that God has put this glory, his glory, into each of us the moment that we became believers. In heaven, the glory will simply be revealed, not created then, implying that the glory to come is already existent, but not apparent. The spirit in us is the foreshadowing of the glory to come, meant to bear witness to the world of what it will be. We, as Christians, give all of creation hope in the wonder of what God has done in indwelling us, in placing his spirit within us. But in the meantime, Paul considers that creation itself eagerly awaits the day of completion. Again, at the fall of man, creation itself was subject to the result of man's sin and will not be made whole until it's released from the bondage of corruption and into the glorious liberty of the children of God that will happen at the end. And until that day comes, creation groans and labors with the birth pangs of that new creation. Which means through nature, we are subject to corruption inherently because nature itself has been corrupted. So again, keep your thumb in Romans. But likewise, back in John chapter 9, verse 3, Jesus makes clear that suffering is not only directly, not always directly traceable to personal sin. Sometimes it is. There are texts in Scripture that clearly indicate that people are hurting and suffering and physically depraved and deprived because of their own sinful and evil ways. But in the case of this man, that's not true. Why then was he born blind? Well, Jesus tells us right there. In John chapter 9, verse 3, it was so that the works of God should be revealed in him. This is what Jesus says. It's an opportunity, not a disaster, but an opportunity for certain things to be manifested in such a person's life and in the lives of people who come in contact with that person that would otherwise never have been able to be brought out. Jesus explained that all of this is because God wants to work in and through this one man's life, ultimately to the glory of God. Jesus pointed the question away from why, like the disciples were asking, why is he like this? And rather, he points the disciples to what? He points them to what God can do, even in this. Now, that doesn't mean that God deliberately caused this one child to be born blind in order that after many years of suffering, his glory should be displayed in the removal of blindness. To think that would be a smear on the character of God. 
It truly means that God overruled the disaster of this one born blind, that God is intervening in this one life that was discarded by nature, so that when the child grew to manhood, he might, by the recovering of his sight, see the glory of God in the face of Christ, and so that others, seeing the work of God, might turn to the true light of the world, none of which had made any of this particularly pleasant for this one man up to now. But God was using this unfortunate result of natural occurrence to prove he is the one who overcomes all of it. Now from there, Jesus went on to say that God's hour to help is struck for this man who was born blind. Look at John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. So instead of focusing on the man as a theology problem, Jesus saw him as a man who needed him, a man that he could uniquely touch. This was an opportunity to work the works of God in love and mercy and grace, to change this one man for eternity and through it to change our hearts, to teach us things about God. As our Lord, I, Lord's eyes fell on this blind man who had been there very likely many years, the disciples seemed to know of him. They knew he was born blind. Jesus knew now was the time for this one man. This man would become a testimony of God's love and mercy and grace, a sort of first fruits, if you will, which takes us again back to Romans 8. Where in Romans 8, verse 23, Paul said not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. You know, <coughs> in the account we're given of this one man. There's no complaining. There's no bitterness. There's no crying out even. The disciples were asking Jesus about him. And Jesus turned to him and said, today's the day. He went to the guy. He put clay on his eyes and then told him what to do. The guy, the guy could have just sat there going, what are you doing? You just made it hurt a whole lot more because you just rubbed a bunch of dirt in my eye. And, you know, reviled Jesus. But we're not told any of that. We're told he immediately got up, obeyed, went to the pool of Siloam, washed his face, and that he could see. You know, he just went and obeyed. I look at the faith of this guy who was born blind, and I see a guy whose heart was ready to be an example to other people, ready to touch other people, wasn't seemingly bemoaning his fate but was totally open to whatever Jesus wanted to do. And he just moved in simple trust. He was a first fruit of sort. Just like Paul was saying, we who are of the first fruits of the Spirit, those who have been born again, accepted Jesus as Savior, we groan within ourselves in the anticipation of the fulfillment of all that God has promised. Him suffering and groaning for deliverance doesn't necessarily mean he was complaining. There's a difference in heart. He was ready and open to what God wanted to do. He was ready and open to what Jesus instructed him to. And he was surely ready and open to come back and acknowledge Jesus as the one he was going to follow before he had even said, laid eyes on him or seemingly really met him. For that's going to come at the end of this passage. But before all of that, he still stood in front of the Pharisees. And went, I can't believe you don't want to follow this guy. <laughs> I mean, look what he did. He gave me sight. This is unheard of in all of creation. And you're debating on whether he's of God or not? <laughs> you know, he was the one that was shocked. More than the spiritual leaders. He was a first fruit. God had already begun to work in his life, I believe, fully before he had sight. Romans 8, 15, we are told that, that we who have received the spirit of adoption, and yet that's the foreshadowing of what's to come, the consummation of which will be the redemption of the body. 
as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53, where Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Jesus worked a very temporal healing to give us an eternal truth. He took utter death from birth. There were eyes that didn't work. And he created new life. He gave him eyes that did. In the very same way that we will be changed forever at the moment we're with Jesus. This man was changed forever even in the temporal, the moment he was with Jesus. As we've discussed, creation, nature, including mankind, has been corrupted. We're mortal, which means we are fallen in sin. By nature, we are headed for death by mortality unless something or someone intervenes and sets right the fallen nature of humanity. We needed a redeemer to buy us back from the nature we were born into. We were born into slavery to sin. But praise the Lord, we have all of that in Jesus Christ. Yet the fulfillment of our redemption is something that for us can feel still distant as we continue to live in a fallen and broken world and we continue to struggle with our flesh nature. But we hope for it in faith and perseverance, trusting that God is faithful to his word and the promised glory will be a reality. And we're told we need to have perseverance. Well, what's that mean? Well, perseverance is the attitude of the soldier who in the thick of battle is not dismayed but fights on stoutly whatever the difficulties. That's what we're called to have. Perseverance that gives us endurance in the battle that we have in the reality of life. Regardless of what we go through now, our hope is in the things to come. And in faith, with perseverance, we eagerly wait with anticipation, the fulfillment of the promises of God. Now, continuing in Romans 8, look at verse 26. Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So while we are persevering in the meantime, even in our weaknesses, even while we struggle with a fallen nature in ourselves and a fallen nature in creation, we have the Spirit himself to help us persevere. God didn't say, You go persevere, work it up in your own strength, good luck, show me you're good enough. Jesus told us that he was going to send a helper, a helper that would come to us, the Spirit of God that dwells inside of us, that makes intercession for us and helps us persevere. We are assured that while waiting for that future glory with Jesus, that he is interceding for us. He is praying for us. For us and him being one with the Spirit and with the Father, we know he's interceding according to the will of the Father within us. And the Holy Spirit's help in intercession is perfect because he searches the heart of those whom he helps and he's able to guide our prayers according to the will of God as we pray and as we seek him. God's help is an enduring promise. He has the ability to work all things for good and to see us through to glorification, even the struggles in, inside of the struggles and infirmities we have to deal with in life. And we're assured by Paul in the next verses in Roman 8. Look, Romans 8. Look at verse 20, 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. 
and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So we can be sure that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to what? According to his purpose. That he predestined for us to be conformed into the image of Jesus. That conforming is not an easy process. When you think about a potter and the clay, conforming the clay to match what the potter has in mind is not an easy process for the clay. He's got to stick his hands in it and get his arms into it and, and hold it and push it and mold it and shape it. And if it isn't going right, just push it back all together and start it over. I don't think the clay enjoys the, the, uh, the process of becoming a pot very much. <laughs> we don't either. But God's promise is to be the potter and that we are the clay. Being conformed to the image of Jesus is not an easy process. But he has called us. He's justified us. He's glorified us. And he will do the work in us inside of all the flaws, inside of our human clay, because there is no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. God's sovereignty and ability to manage every aspect of our lives is demonstrated in the fact that all things work together for good to those who love God. Even though in Romans 8.18 we're told that we must face sufferings from this present time, God's able to make even those sufferings work together for our good and His glory, just like He did with that one blind man. It says that God is able to work all things, not some things. There's nothing you're going to face that God can't work in your life for good. He works them for good together, not in isolation. Promise to those who love God and the biblical understanding of love. A lot of times it's <laughs> us being able to choose to die to ourselves. And God works in our hearts, if we let him, in the midst of the affairs of our lives because we are called according to his purpose. We're told God foreknew us. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. We have all been predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That's his goal for all. And you can take that and go, hey, that's us in this room. But, you know, Jesus didn't die for a select few. When he said it's finished, he meant it was paid for for everybody. Jesus paid for all sin. Not just the sins, sins of some that are elect. But what he's talking about is as we have chosen to accept salvation, then that predestination to be conformed into the image of his son is what his goal for us is. And that eternal chain of God's working is seen in the connection between all of that. He, that he foreknew us, that he predestined, that he called, that he justified and he glorified. Everybody is who he's trying to reach, not just a select few. You know, these Roman Christians really needed this assurance inside of all they were facing. They needed to know that God hadn't begun a work in them simply to abandon them in the midst of their present suffering. They were being persecuted and they were being martyred. I'll know about any of you in this room, but as far as I know, no one here is being martyred. No one's being persecuted unto martyrdom. That's what they were enduring. We are enduring things that are unique to us. Now, may it get to that? I don't know. Prayerfully not. But regardless of what it is that we have to face, what we know is that we're not alone in it. Because inside of all of that, God was, or Paul was telling these Roman believers not to worry. God's working good in you. Stay strong and persevere, and he will be glorified. Likewise, no matter what you are facing, God not, did not begin a work in you only to abandon you partway through. As Philippians 1, six says, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. When does that tell you you will be complete? In the day of Jesus Christ. Which means he will be working on you until you're with him. He doesn't see you as a problem. He's not going to look at you and go, man, I'm so tired of working in that dude's life. But he sees the end from the beginning. He sees you as you will be when you stand before him without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. And in the meantime, tirelessly 
He continues to work on you, to conform you, to get you to the point that you will be when you are ultimately with him. But in the here and now, our participation in this eternal plan is essential. It's reflected in its goal that we might be conformed into the image of his son. It's a process God does with our cooperation and will not be something he just does to us. You're not going to wake up one day and go, hey, I'm all fixed. <laughs> but we have to actively engage in this. In Romans 8.31, it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him only also free, freely give us all things? If God didn't spare his son, but he treasured you enough to send Jesus to endure all that Jesus did, why should we doubt anything else he told us that he's going to do in our life? He will see you through anything. You know, as you look at the book of Romans, if all you had of this letter was the first few chapters, you could, you'd probably believe that God was against you. And man, he must hate everybody. He's an angry God. Because Paul has to set all the groundwork for the wonder of what grace is. Paul was careful to show us the length that God went to save man from his wrath and to equip us for victory over sin and death. And because of that, who can doubt that God is for us? Despite the suffering Christians face, if God is for us, what does it matter if anything or anyone else is against us? One person plus God makes an unconquerable majority. It's kind of a trite saying, but it's true. Men can certainly be deceived into thinking God is for them, though, when he actually is not. Cultists and those like them, ones who do evil in God's name, ones who are doing things that do not line up with the word of God or the will of God in the slightest, these are not things that glorify God. No, simply evoking the name of God does not mean he's for those things. There's one requirement. Because Paul said for, it's for those who are in Jesus Christ. God is for them. God is working all things for good according to his purposes. And if God did not withhold his own son from us, there's nothing he will withhold from us. He frees us in true liberty absolutely and completely from the law of sin, the war of the flesh, and the pull of nature. He will sustain us until the end with his superabounding grace. And because of that, there's an amazing truth that Paul tells us that there is no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. But he tells us in chapter 8, verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Because of that, there's no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. In verse 34, it says, he who, is he, who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And because of that, there's no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. In verse 35, he said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or any other affliction or infirmity that you could name? No, nothing will separate you. And because of that, there's no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. In verse 37, he said, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no matter the circumstances you may face, no matter the affliction or the pain, no matter how you're treated by others or no matter how you treat yourself. None of the sufferings of this present time can separate us from the love of God. And because of that, there is now no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. His superabounding grace that covers us in all of our sin means that ultimately we will have final victory promised through Jesus. We have no need to fear the battle of our flesh and the spirit. Grace covers us when we stop trying to produce all the right answers 
and reactions, when we stop trying to be the perfect Christian and we realize that casting ourselves upon God through Jesus Christ and the grace and mercy, mercy freely given to us, then we can claim the liberty that comes from being set free from the slavery we were under. We won't look at others as a theological puzzle, wondering what caused them to be in the situation they are. We won't look at ourselves as a theological puzzle and conundrum. But we'll look at all of it and go, oh Lord, I just need you. As the man is going to say, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. That's simple trust. You know, we can look at all this. And it's so easy to take for granted and not live a life that allows for God to complete the work that he began in us. We can waste a whole lot of time on frivolous things. You know, you guys know who David Cassidy is? You know, he's a, he's a Partridge family. He's an actor back in the 60s and entertainer for many, many years. Well, you know, he was fame, very popular, had uh, <laughs> a good life as far as the word standards would go, as far as you, you, the world would consider. But you know, when he died a few years ago, as he laid on his bed and he reflected upon his life, his last words were recorded as so much wasted time. He looked back on his life, not going, man, look at all I did. I was on TV for many years. I had the adulation of the multitudes. People loved me. Look at all the money I had, the fame and fortune. No, he looked at it all and went, man, so much wasted time. That's a sad way to look back at your life. There was a guy named Charles C.T. Studd, and he wrote a poem called Only One Life. This guy lived in the, the late 1800s, and he played cricket for England. If you don't know what cricket is, look it up. It's a really popular game in other parts of the world. America looks at it and goes, I'm sorry, a game that takes three days to play and you have to take tea breaks, that's not really a sport, you know? But cricket is a game played worldwide. Well, C.T. Studd played it for, for the English national team from 1881 to 1884. Then he came to know Jesus. He became a born-again Christian. He left cricket and went to Cambridge, which is where after his brother became seriously ill, he was confronted with the question, what is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes face to face with eternity? And so six years after his conversion to Christianity, he began to take his walk with the Lord seriously, saying, I knew that cricket would not last, the honor would not last, and nothing in this world would last, but it was worthwhile living for the world to come. And so he did. When his father died, he took his inheritance of 29,000 pounds and broke it up between George Mueller's mission and orphanage, George Holland's work with the poor in England, and Commissioner Booth Tucker's Salvation Army work in India. And from there, he became a missionary himself, first going to China to work with Hudson Taylor. And he said of his missionary work, someone to live within the sound of, ch of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And while he was in China, he met and married his wife Priscilla. They had four daughters in the late 1800s. They all went back to England, and he then came, and he ministered in America. And from 1900 to 1906, then he went and pastored a church in southern India. Then he went back to England again. And in 1910, he went to the Sudan. In 1913, to the Belgian Congo. And he frequented Central Africa on mission trips while being based out of England. He fell sick and died on the mission field in 1931 at the age of 70. He died in Congo, in the city of Ibambi, and his son-in-law, Norman Grubb, picked up the work and continued it. He founded the Worldwide Evangeliz Evangelization Crusade, now known as WEC International, that continues on today. It was on, he was honored by the King of Belgium with the Royal Order of the Lion as a national hero in Belgium for his tireless efforts to bring the truth of Jesus Christ to those who have not heard. That's a guy that I don't think was laying on his bed at the end of his life feeling the need to lament so much wasted time. That's a guy that was able to look back and go, Lord, I hope I did everything you wanted me to do. Now take me home.
I just want to be with you. Well, he wrote a poem called Only One Life. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord, to meet and stand before his judgment seat, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow thy word to keep, faithful and true whatever the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, t'was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You know, you look at a guy like that, and you see how he reflected on life. I guarantee you, he was not laying in his bed saying, so much wasted time. You know, the man that was born blind, However many in years he endured of that. Enduring the scorn and the shame of people looking at him with that same theological questions that the disciples had. Pfft, wonder what he did. He must have been a sinner from the womb. Or looking at his parents and going, look at those two. Wonder what they did that caused their son to be born blind. All of that that he endured ultimately culminated in one chance meeting for him one seemingly chance meeting with Jesus Christ where he put some mud on his eye and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he did, he had his sight. From that moment, from that moment, he knew that Jesus was the one. None of the suffering of all the prior years seemed to matter to him anymore because he boldly stood before the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the day, the authorities, and said, this is the guy. This is the one. He's obviously of God. I can't believe you don't see it. But all I know is I was blind, but now I see. Inferring that you guys can see, but boy, are you blind. None of that suffering mattered to him anymore because his eyes were now on Jesus. You know, next week we're going to continue on and look at the man's healing and the aftermath of all of it. And as we do, we're going to see the words that, of Jesus that they were true. Of what he said in John 9, 3, that neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. We're going to see that he chose to walk in freedom. Jesus worked in him, and he was able to see the good of it. This one who had been living with infirmity that others decried to be a result of sin walked in the truth and freedom of who he was as a result of one encounter with Jesus. So even in the face of persecution from the spiritual leadership of the day, he stood strong. What faith? And the guy hadn't even seen Jesus yet. The one that others saw as a defect and a reject, Jesus saw as his. That was all he needed to know. And I don't know what you guys are facing individually, privately, or corporately. I don't know what we may face as a people. But there's one thing I know. 
My eyes are fixed on my Savior. None of the other stuff matters. Then I'm free. I don't care what anyone else thinks. I don't care what the world does. I don't care how I'm treated. All I know is that, man, I was spiritually blind, but one day I saw Jesus, and now I'm spiritually, I've got sight, and I can see, and I have life, and life more abundantly. You know, I just want his love to be flowing out of me because the reality is, as we go through this passage, that's what I see already flowing out of this guy is his love. I don't want any of you at the end of things to look back and go, oh man, so much wasted time. You do only have one life. And that truth remains that what you do for Christ is never wasted time. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us the, the insights into what you did while you walked the face of this earth. Lord, may we hold on to you so voraciously. May we cling to you so completely that no matter what we endure or what we face or what we see, that our eyes would be fixed on you. May we trust you. Because ultimately, that is the good that you work in our lives, no matter what we endure. That you teach us more about you. We can get all caught up in the, the temporal, physical answers that we want. When you may have something so more rich and deep in mind for the eternal. May we trust you enough to endure what you would have us to endure for the sake of your glory. May we be usable for your kingdom. May we bring you pleasure. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. And thank you, Lord, that one day we're going to meet that one guy. And he's going to tell us all about this and all about what happened afterwards. We're going to be able to rejoice in, with him, glorifying your name because you touched his life. We too are going to be able to recount to him all the things that you've done in our life. And in the same way, I'm sure he will rejoice at what you've done in our life too. Oh Lord, may we live worthy of the calling with which we were called. May we please you. In Jesus' name, amen.